The world is literally reliant on constant and never-ending stimulus from central banks and governments. Without it, everything would collapse. That was clearly proven in 2018, if it wasn't already evident before then. The IMF and Biz have been suggesting they need more and more power in order to backstop the events which will invariably occur at some point. Global governance is the ultimate goal. They just need another crisis to make it happen. You came here for the truth, so let me unveil that for you. Today we're going to talk about the echoes from the year 2000. I want to cover the real estate market. I want to show you what the IMF and the biz have said. A lot to cover in this video, so let's begin by taking a look at this. What you're seeing is the S&P 500 looking at it from the year 2000 and beyond. And what we can see here is that previously, when we had this yield curve inversion that took place during this time, just as it does throughout every cycle, we had some interesting events that occurred. You can see that there was a little fake out that takes place in 2000 around August, but the actual crisis didn't begin to unfold unfold until a few months later when things actually started to fall for an extended period of time. So we need to know is this yield curve inversion something that is just quick then it reverses or is this going to be sustained? You could see the S&P 500 peaks out right here which is again around that August time frame. A few months later things start to fall and everybody knows what happened after that. So I'm just showing you here as an example of what happened during that time frame frame to give us a little insight on what could happen this time around. I'm going to be watching it closely and of course bring you all the details. I wanted to look at something that ultimately is very important because we can point to the yield curve inversions, we can look at PE ratios, but there is something that's much more important and that's what's happening with the average individual. Well look at this. Homes are actually a bit more affordable today than a year ago, and experts are watching to see if that will continue in 2019. So CBS puts out this information, sounds pretty good, but look at the second line. Still, in more than 70% of the country, home prices are more than the average worker can afford. How does that make any sense? 70% of the country, people can't afford where they're living. How are they buying it? Well, of course, they do so on debt. They don't just have a mortgage, that's only one piece of the puzzle. They've got their credit cards, their student debts, home equity line of credit, and everything in between. All of this is being financed by debt, but eventually that comes to an end. Nobody knows how, nobody knows when, but eventually it does, and the bigger the bubble is, the worse it will be for those people. In the bottom paragraph, they mention something that is very interesting. While average earners nationwide need to spend only about one third of their income on a home, residents in Brooklyn and Manhattan must shell out more than 115% of their income in San Francisco. They must spend 103% of their income. Now, these are two very popular areas. We're looking at New York. We're looking at San Francisco. Obviously, areas like this have seen an an extremely high rate of appreciation in these houses. There's no question, I'm not denying that. There's also a very large percentage of the population in these two areas. If we look at even spreading it out further to the major cities in California, as well as those in New York, this really contributes to the extremes that we have seen. Imagine you have to pay all of your income somehow just to be able to live somewhere. That's what people are doing. Now, obviously, they're getting additional sources of income. There's a lot going on here that this one study is not going to tell you, but it does share the fact that homes are too expensive for the average person to afford. Pending home sales have been consistently year over year doing very bad. In fact, it goes all the way from the beginning of 2018 up until the present, month after month, it's not looking good. Now, what happens in the following months considering the fact that interest rates have declined somewhat? We've been watching the mortgage rates coming down. That could get a little bit of growth happening. Obviously, people are desperate. They're seeing it as a opportunity, they might jump on that. So I'm going to bring that information to you. In the last month's data, it did not show that to be the case, but we'll see because they have come down a little bit more. So I'll bring that information to you next month and we'll see where we're at. 
There are a lot of areas around the United States which have seen negative growth in their real estate prices, but you have to understand the fact that these were very high to begin with. However, there are many people, many people in the real estate industry, in the financial industry that had told you real estate prices will never go down ever again. The font is quite small. I'll zoom in here as you see that we are looking at the very top of the list, San Jose as an example. February 2019 versus the February 2018 price growth pace change minus 45%. Huge difference. So something really, really changed. Now, it doesn't mean that you're not seeing prices at extremely high levels throughout San Jose. It absolutely is. Houses are extremely expensive. They could cost more tomorrow. I'm not denying that. But but what you can see here is an example of an area that people can't afford. Yes, there is a top 10%. They're buying into this area. They're going to do fine probably as long as everything stays the way it is and there is no crisis. But the average person, you need average middle class workers to be able to live in these areas too. But there aren't any affordable homes. I already did a video about this recently. People are now converting these different spaces like like boiler rooms into places for people to live and they're approving them. The government is approving them, allowing it to happen because people cannot find affordable housing. A similar situation you're looking at in San Francisco, Seattle, and many others. You can see it through the list. If you're interested on in checking that out, you can pause the video or look at the link in the description. This article here out of Market Watch is talking about evictions and rents. I just wanted to touch on a couple points. Stable housing is increasingly out of reach for many Americans as both rentals and homes to own grow more expensive and options dwindle. Evictions may be one of the most visible manifestation. Essentially, this study looked at what they call serial eviction, so multiple evictions on one particular individual. It has not been this bad since the housing crisis. There's a problem right now that's going on in real estate. A lot of people are not aware of it. A lot of people are choosing to ignore it, but it's happening today. Even while interest rates are historically very low, mortgage rates are still very low and they've dropped somewhat, and still it is unaffordable. As a reminder, nearly half Half of Americans are quote rent burdened which means they spend more than 30% of their income on rent. Homelessness is on the rise as well. Nationally as many as one in seven children may have experienced eviction in the last decade. During this last decade we've seen so much growth. We've seen the economy booming. We've seen all of this spectacular and wonderful benefits of the central bank programs and yet here we are seeing the same events from the financial crisis and housing crisis happening yet again. We are still building the wrong kind of homes for renters. This is also out of market watch. 11 million Americans spend more than 50% of their income on rent. This information is actually as of December 2017. This has obviously gotten worse as time has gone on. Wages have never kept up and yet we have housing that continues to increase overall. Newly built rental units are higher cost. You can see the pie charts that are here comparing 2011 to 2016. You know what's happening here is that the average individual can't afford to buy, can't afford to rent. The major cities where most of the jobs are, are located in areas that are so expensive and the average person is simply burdened by all of this. They can't do it. They can't make ends meet and I've shown you all the details related to that as well. Now I want to give you an idea of what's happening today because the IMF and the biz have been warning here consistently for a period of time saying there is another crisis eventually coming. There's a lot of debt and all of this is adding up. It's piling up and eventually there's going to be something that governments are not prepared for and so you need to smarten up. Now, as I've always said, I don't agree with these two institutions in their solutions that they provide. I don't like what they say, what they do, but I do like their reports and where they point to the problems. They point out the right stuff, but when they go into a country, they aim to ruin it. 
IMF's firepower insufficient to respond to a major new crisis. This is according to the head of the biz. The IMF does not have sufficient lending capacity to respond if a major new emerging market crisis affecting several countries erupted. Essentially, they're saying that if we start to have this cascading effect that I talk about all the time, there's no possible way that the IMF can deal with it. According to the biz general manager, he said that as of the last reviews of the IMF quotas, how much member countries pay in and the voting rights that go with that had failed to ensure that it had sufficient financial resources. In my first book, for those who have read it, you might remember that I talked about the IMF suggesting that following this crisis, referring to the financial crisis of 2008, the IMF will expand its powers. Then in the second book, I wrote about the fact that they had already expanded multiple times since then, and here we are again seeing that happen. They're asking for more power. I do believe that don't, they don't have sufficient resources, but they shouldn't even exist in the first place. Whole different story. This leaves us with the problem of having inadequate resources and having to improvise in times of crisis. The mission of the fund is there. Oh yes, they want to help out, but they want your money. Your tax money, wherever you are, is going towards the IMF. You can't vote on it. You can't choose what's done with it. There's no elections taking place, and yet that's some of your money. If the fund cannot do it, others will have to do it. Otherwise, the economic costs will be huge. And that is very important to understand. The next crisis is going to be too big to fail, but also too big to bail. I don't know how it's going to all play out, but it will be devastating. That's for sure. Now, the IMF's Christine Lagarde, something that I always refer to on here, because like I said, we should pay attention to what they say, not necessarily agree with what they do. She said that the Eurozone is not resilient enough to emerge unscathed from unexpected economic storms. Yes, it's more resilient than a decade ago when the global financial crisis struck, but it's not resilient enough. That's what she says. I'm not necessarily agreeing with this portion, but there's going to be something that builds and brews, whether that's the real estate market, whether that's corporate debt, whether it's some sort of derivative, maybe it's the CLO. I'm not sure, but there is a worsening set of conditions that are occurring today. And what do they do? What is the response to the slowdown that has been noted all across the world? Well, you remember on Wednesday, the ECB added to growth worries when its chief, Mario Draghi, hinted that interest rates would stay low for longer than previously anticipated to stimulate growth and inflation. Well, they did a new round of quantitative easing even after they said this would stop. They're bringing interest rates down to the floor and they they are not stopping that as well. They'll probably drop the interest rates even further to prevent deflation, even though all of these years they've been doing these measures and yet all they have is deflation. So pay very close attention to what happens in Europe. It is likely to have a problem there first before the United States, though it can happen anywhere. As I have noted many times before, the process of contagion doesn't happen with people watching. There are corporations and countries that own each other's debt and equities and bonds and all kinds of different derivative products and this will spell disaster when it starts to fall. 2008 was just the tip of the iceberg. That's all for this video. If you found it informative, please give me a thumbs up. When you give me a thumbs up, you are supporting this channel. So I do appreciate that very much. Last but not least, if you want the financial education you weren't taught in school, these two books have everything you need. You can get all the details about the foundation, the history, the asset classes, making money, so much more. Check them out at the link in the description if you want the audiobook that's available at themoneygps.com. This video has been going absolutely crazy. We're witnessing the slowdown that is happening here. 5,600 stores in the U.S. That is a record level at this point in the year. Check it out and I will see you there.